All right, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the first of our three live presentations about the Tour du Mont Blanc in, in 2024. My name is Marvin Faure. I'm the founder and general manager of Alpine Coles, which is a group of cycling coaches based in the Alps, specialized in sportives and grand fondos. This first presentation is about guidelines for your personal training plan and will especially focus on the first part of your training, meaning the period from now until April. It will last about 40 minutes. The remaining two presentations are on the 28th of March, when uh, I will present part two of the training plan. And finally, on June the 27th, where I'll present how to get your best results on the day. I'll answer any questions at the end, but you can also send questions to me by email at info at alpinecalls.com, uh, either, either today or, 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 or later on, uh, no problem at all. So here's the agenda for this evening. First of all, I'll present a set of guiding principles for an effective training plan for the, for the tour. Then I'll show you a, train, a framework presentation plan that you can adapt for yourself. We'll then look in detail at the preparation phase, which is the part between now and the end of March. And then, and this is all new for this year, I want to go into some depth about how to develop a nutrition strategy that will be really effective in supporting your training. And last but not least, we'll touch on some off-the-bike training. So here's a quick reminder of the route which is often referred to as the toughest one-day sportive in the world. I'm not going to analyze it today, just to highlight that it covers 330 kilometers and includes 8,300 meters of climbing, spread out over five major climbs and a bunch of shorter ones, adding up to a total of about 154 kilometers of climbing. Uh, these are obviously huge numbers, and you mustn't take this event lightly. I can't emphasize too highly how tough this event is, and therefore the importance of, of preparing properly for it. The start is before dawn at five o'clock in the morning, and unlike the guy in the photo, many will finish after nightfall, perhaps having to do the descent from the Cormier de Roseland in the dark, as well as the final climb to the Sezi. The cutoff time to finish is midnight, so all finishers take somewhere between 12 and 19 hours. In a good year, only about 60% manage to finish. So don't ask what happens if the weather is bad. It's above all an endurance challenge. And although all participants are timed, there's no official classification and all finishers receive a medal and a gold certificate. It's really a challenge on three levels, mental, physical, and nutritional. And in my view, in that order, the most likely reason to abandon is mental. You, you just have enough and you get off and stop. For most first timers, it'll be the toughest thing you've ever done by some margin, at least on a bike. At the halfway point, you'll have ridden almost the equivalent of the Marmot, uh, but it's still only halfway. And if you've ridden the Marmot, you'll know that's a tough enough challenge by itself. To reach the finish, you'll probably push yourself to your limits and then you'll have to go beyond. You can expect to experience highs and lows with moments of euphoria where you can't believe how strong you feel, followed by moments of despair when you can't believe how bad you feel. Many people think of quitting more than once. The key to it is preparation. If you prepared properly, you should be able to find the tenacity and determination you need to keep going. So if this doesn't scare you a little bit, it probably should. Before going any further, let me take a minute to tell you how we can help. We have a series of training camps in 2024, all with active coaching, any of which would help you get a better result at the, at the Tour du Mont Blanc. The first one starts in two weeks time in the Canary Islands, where we can expect to ride in summer kit and warm sunshine while everybody else in the Northern Hemisphere is freezing. I don't know where you are, but where I am, the snow on the ground uh, outside. Uh, we can still take one or two more people on this camp, uh, but you would need to be very quick. The second one is in uh, Provence in April. Uh, the third one is a short camp in the Vosges in the east of France in May, focused on qualifying for the UCI Grand Fondo World Championships. There's some good, good, some good skills practice there. And finally, in June in Provence, uh, we're doing a special Etape du Tour camp, which will include a full reconnaissance of the attack as well as lots of skills practice. So, so, so any of those would be would be helpful. If you want more details, please go to our website or send me an email, info at alpinecalls.com. That's the end of the short commercial break. So let's talk now about what it takes to do well at the Tour du Mont Blanc. 
you can't develop an effective training plan until you understand this. I've analyzed the demands in three categories. So let's uh, take a look at them. The first is physiological. You need excellent aerobic endurance for the 330 kilometers, and you need a high power to weight ratio for the 154 kilometers of climbing. So those are pretty obvious. Now a bit more technical, you need a high capacity to burn fat instead of glycogen at the pace you'll be riding at. And you need the ability to recover quickly on the descent between long efforts on the climbs. Now, psychological, you need to be able to maintain focus and motivation and lucidity for the time it takes to finish, even when you're severely fatigued. You need the self-discipline to stick to your optimum pace on the climbs, even if others are going faster than you. You need the ability to tolerate high levels of pain and discomfort for long periods of time. And you need the ability to stay positive and to deal with inevitable setbacks and negative thoughts. Finally, technical. You need excellent climbing skills, obviously, on the long climbs and, and varied gradients. You need the ability to refuel effectively with nutrition and hydration choices that work for you over such a, a, a long period. You need excellent descending and cornering skills. And it's certainly possible to reach the finish line of the Tour du Mont Blanc without being excellent on all these criteria, but it will, however, take you longer and feel harder. So each criterion is important and your particular combination will determine your overall performance or indeed whether or not you're able to finish. And so, so again, all of them are important. Now, coming on to your personal training plan. I have a challenge here because I know nothing about you, the people who are listening to me. It's important to understand there's no such thing as a standard training plan for the Tour du Mont Blanc that will work for everybody. The best training plan for you is one that's been designed with your personal goals, your strengths, your limiters, your experience, your context, your constraints in mind. And on top of that is constantly updated for you as and when things change, as they always do. So for all these reasons, we're not providing a detailed day-by-day -day training plan. What we are providing is a framework and a set of guidelines for you to think about and adapt to your own unique circumstances. The goal is to give you the means to think carefully about the process and to take responsibility for your own preparation. So be aware that some of what I say may not be appropriate for you because I don't know your individual situation. So with that said, let's take a look at the guiding principles. The first and most important principle, if you want to do well at the Tour du Mont Blanc, is that you need to make it a priority. Not only in your training, but also, at least to some extent, in your life for the next six months. If this needs negotiation with your partner or family, then now is the time to do that. Next, you must be consistent. It's no use training really hard for two weeks and then doing nothing for the next two weeks or only training on weekends, for example. You should be doing some sort of training on at least four and better five days per week. Point three, the single most important quality you need to develop is your aerobic base. Remember, this is number one on the event demands. Unfortunately, there are no shortcuts to this. You need to spend a lot of time on your bike, mostly at low intensity. This will create the endurance adaptations you need without, unnetting, without adding unnecessary fatigue and therefore allowing you to keep training. I want to go this, into this in a bit more detail because it's often misunderstood. Why train at low intensity? Surely, if you want to ride faster, you should train faster. Well, no, it's not so simple. The key point is that you get all the aerobic adaptations you need at low intensity. And making every ride as hard as you can is a very ineffective way to train for the Tour du Mont Blanc for at least two reasons. One, when you do that, you're training your body to rely on carbohydrate for fuel, which is inherently limiting, as we'll see shortly. And two, you're limiting your ability to build your aerobic base because of all the extra fatigue. It works when you first start cycling, but we'll, you'll soon hit a plateau, as, as some of you may have found. The chart shows the percent of time spent training at different uh, intensities, with one being very easy and seven being close to all of them. 
The red and the blue bars represent two contrasting training approaches that we see all the time. Most beginners, and indeed many club cyclists, train something like the blue bars on this chart, with most of their time spent riding moderately hard in zones three and four, which is basically as hard as they can manage for, for, for two to three hours. It's now been shown that it's more effective to do the vast majority of your training at high volume and low intensity, combined with a small amount at high intensity, as shown by the red bars on the chart. And this is called polarized training, and you also hear about it being talked about as 80-20 or, or, or 90-10. To do polarized training right, you need to be clear on the zones. So here's a very simple three zone model, which is all you really need for the Tour du Mont Blanc. The most important zone boundary is between zone one and zone two on this model, the moderate and the heavy zones. This is called LT1, the boundary there, which is the first lactate threshold. And it's the point at which the lactate concentration in your blood begins to increase as you do more work and use more oxygen. Beware that in a five or seven or seven zone model, the moderate zone, so that zone one here, is split into two. So LT1 then, then takes place near the top of zone two in a five or seven zone model. Okay, just so that can be a bit confusing. You should do the majority of your training at or below this point, LT1. So how can you determine it? Well, the best way is what all the professionals do and many elite riders. Do a lab test where you measure the lactate concentration in your blood while you increase the load by steps. This is obviously, however, quite expensive and not always easy to find. So the easy, easy alternative is to try to talk with your riding buddy. If you can't carry out a normal conversation with no effort, you're riding too hard. You know, if, if it's really tough to talk normally, you're riding too hard. It's as simple as that. This will probably take place at a much lower intensity than you think. For most people, it's no more than 60 to 65% of their maximum heart rate or of their FTP. And it may be lower still. Okay, so when you go out for a club ride, it'll almost certainly be significantly higher than this, which is a problem. Now, back to our list of guiding principles. The fourth principle is to increase the load progressively. If you're currently only training, let's say eight hours a week, and you want to increase this to 12 hours per week, you should take a month to get there because your body needs the time to adapt. You can't do a sudden step change like that. Yes, you can if you, if you go to a, a, a training camp for a week, you can do a lot more in one week, but you can't maintain that level. So to be able to maintain it, you need to get there progressively. Number five, never lose sight of the fact that your body only gets stronger when you rest and recover. Training actually breaks you down. It creates the stimulus needed, so you've got to do the training, obviously, but you only actually get stronger during recovery. Now, you don't get stronger when you're training, you get stronger when you recover. So it's really important to allow your body the time it needs to recover, adapt, and get stronger. The sixth principle is to do as much climbing as possible. By the time you get to June, you should be, uh, you should be able to do at least one ride totaling four or better 5,000 meters, keeping the intensity low, as we've already discussed. The harder you climb, the less total climbing you'll be able to do. So the less effective your training will be. And remember the Tour du Mont Blanc is an endurance event, not a race, and you'll have to ride it at a lower intensity than you would at a more typical Grand Fondo like the Marmot or the Etape du Tour. If you live in a flat area, this is obviously a bit problematic. Your options are one, to do hill repeats on whatever you can find nearby, even if it's just a short hill, it's better than nothing. Two, you can travel obviously whenever possible at the weekends or, or whenever to, to find some climbs. Or three, do the climbs indoors on a smart trainer. You know, the, the modern the, the modern smart trainers and, and the applications are, are, are really good for that. It's obviously not as good as the real thing, but it's, it's the next best thing. Number seven, develop your technical skills. You should include some exercises in your training to do this. Skills such as descending, cornering, eating on the bike, and your ability to 
take off your jacket or put it back on while riding. You know, this can save us a substantial amount of time. So definitely skills which are worth, uh, worth developing. Finally, number eight, develop your fat burning or fat oxidation capacity. And this probably also needs some exploration, uh, some explanation to understand why it's important. So I'll take a, take a minute or two to dig into that. The fact is our bodies have two possible sources for energy, basically carbohydrates or fat. But there are important differences between the two. Your body can only store about 2000 calories of energy from carbohydrate in the form of glycogen, whereas it can store at least 50,000 calories in the form of fat. This means that we have an engine that can burn two different types of fuel, fat and, and carb, carbohydrate, but we only have a small tank of one type of fuel while there's a huge tank of the other. This wouldn't matter if the two types of fuel were totally interchangeable, but of course they're not. So fat is very good for fueling work at low intensity and at a steady pace, like a diesel engine. But it's no good for fueling high intensity and high power because the oxidation rate or the rate of conversion of fat into energy is just too slow. It's physically too slow. Only carbohydrate can do this. So you can think of carbohydrate as working a bit like the afterburner on a jet fighter. It provides a huge boost in power, but it burns through the fuel very quickly. So your time at high power is limited. You simply can't eat and digest anywhere near enough carbs while you're riding at high power to replace what you're burning. So there's therefore a huge advantage if you can burn a high percentage of fat at race pace because you're conserving your glycogen for the hardest efforts only. And this actually is, 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 is almost the secret, if you will, of pros and elite riders. They can do this and amateurs struggle. And it's one of the major differences. So let me underline that for the Torji Mon uh, underline this for the Torji Monblock, which is a metabolic challenge above all. If you're going to finish in 19 hours or less than 19 hours, you'll do approximately 15 hours of climbing. Doing the calculations for a 70 kilogram cyclist with 10 kilograms of bike and equipment, he or she will expend about 11,000 calories in energy on top of the 2,000 or so required just to stay alive. The maximum amount that you can reasonably consume on the bike in 19 hours is around 6,000 calories. That means consuming over 300 calories per hour, which means a large bottle of energy drink and two or three energy bars or the equivalent hour after hour for 19 hours. That's a challenge. Remember that you only have about 2000 calories scored in glycogen. So this means that there's a deficit of at least 3000 calories. If you can't get this from fat, you're going to find it really hard to continue. And I believe this is a major reason why so many people are forced to abandon. It's even worse, of course, if they push too hard from the start and burn through their glycogen early. But being fat adapted is absolutely crucial. Now, the fact is the ability to burn fat varies a lot from one cyclist to another. As you can see from this chart taken from a research study measuring the variations in fat oxidation on a population of trained athletes, so it's very relevant to us. Even amongst trained athletes, the variations are huge with fat oxidation ranging from, uh, from 100% to 20% at rest. Yeah, only 20% at rest. You know, these people are not even exercising. So it's hard to overemphasize the value of being able to get the majority of your energy from fat at race pace. The, the guy... The guy that can get 100% of his energy from fat at rest is already at a huge advantage compared to the, the one on the other end of the scale. In a nutshell, it means you can go harder for longer without running out of energy. Now, the good news is that this is trainable, at least to some extent. We'll see how in a few minutes when we get to nutrition. Back to our list of guiding principles. The ninth is to increase your pain tolerance. There's no doubt that finishing the Tour du Mont Blanc is going to hurt, and a large part of the training is getting accustomed to the discomfort. The more you experience it in your training, the easier the event itself will feel. 
The difference between the Tour du Mont Blanc and other events, like the Marmot, for example, is that the pain comes from the duration of the event and not the intensity. Our tenth and final guiding principle is that during your training, you should monitor your readiness for high load. This is important because research over the last few years has shown that pushing your limits in training only has a positive effect if your body is in a state to benefit from it. So let's look at how we can determine that, how we can monitor it. The issue is that recovery and adaptation are inhibited by stress, whether it be acute or chronic, training stress or life stress, or a mixture of all of that. Your body can't tell the difference. All this stress forces your body to secrete various hormones, such as adrenaline and cortisol, that are needed to manage the stress, but which also inhibit your training adaptation. So if you come home after a stressful day at work and immediately jump on your turbo trainer for an interval session, you should be aware that you might feel psychologically a bit better, but the training value was almost certainly zero because you've just added more catabolic hormones to your bloodstream when what you actually need to take advantage of the training stress are anabolic hormones. So it would be far better to do a gentle zone one session to eliminate the stress hormones and give a chance to your parasympathetic nervous system to start working properly. So how do you know if you're ready for a long ride or for a high intensity session? There are three key indicators. The first is to figure out how much stress you're under. You can obviously estimate this by paying attention to your feelings and just being aware of, of, of your general stress levels. Or you can measure it by using resting heart rate and heart rate variability, HRV. However, be aware that this is only useful if one, you do it every day, so you know what a normal reading is for you, for you personally, because a normal reading for you might not be the same as for me. And two, if you take the time to learn how to interpret the values, because they, it's not obvious, it's not simple to interpret. And so you need to have learned how to do that. The second indicator is the state of your muscles and, and the tissue repair, especially how much fatigue or soreness you can feel in your muscles. So if you feel, if you're feeling very stiff or very sore in your legs, then it's not a smart idea to go and do another a uh, very long ride or, 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 or an interval session. The third was developed for professionals and it really only applies if you're training hard day after day for an extended period. A so-called submaximal fatigue test will tell you if the glycogen stores in your muscles have recovered or not from the previous days. Okay, some of this is a bit complicated. This isn't the moment to go into all of this in detail. Let me just summarize that you should only do a high intensity workout or a long ride when you have low stress, low fatigue and no muscle soreness or, or very low muscle soreness. If you want to know more, you can find articles on our blog or, of course, do a Google search. So now we've talked about general principles. Let's take a look at the training plan framework. It includes three phases or periods. First one, preparation, where you prepare your body for an increased training load and you develop your aerobic and fat burning capacities. That's from now until the, the end of March. Then the pre-competition period where you add more volume to get yourself ready for the actual event. And finally, the competition or taper period where you reduce your fatigue without losing any fitness. Here you can see our framework training plan, which you can download directly from the Torgi Mont, Mont Blanc website under training, or just send me an email to request it. It's a framework and not a detailed day-by-day -day training plan for the reasons I've already explained. The idea is that if you understand the reasoning and the rationale, you can design your own training plan that's perfectly tailored for you. I'm not going to go through the plan in detail. Let me just highlight the structure. The first page tells you what to focus on during each period and why. And there is a second page with suggested workouts for each period. Each phase is broken down into four week cycles containing three load weeks and one recovery week. Remember, recovery is absolutely essential uh, to, to, in order to adapt. Otherwise, your training is wasted. And there's a target training load for each week that you can see there with that um, jagged line. 
If you're over 50 years old, be aware there's evidence that adopting a three-week cycle of two week, two load weeks and one recovery week might be beneficial because after the age of 50, we take longer to recover. We need more recovery. This is the second page, which provides you with a typical training week and suggested workouts during each period. So, so again, they're suggestions. You need to adapt them for, for what makes sense to, to for you. So how do you take this framework and customize it? It's best to be pragmatic and start with your constraints and especially your training time availability. So you want to build a sort of um, spreadsheet like this. Be realistic. Confirm it with your partner and family because that might save you a lot of misunderstandings and arguments uh, down the road. Which days of the week can you train and for how long? What are the family or work commitments that will prevent you from training on certain days or weeks? So once you've thought this all through and, and put it on a calendar, you can block off week by week the training time you'll have available. You'll probably end up with something that's quite a long way from ideal, but that can't be helped. It's always like that. You then adjust things and adapt them as much as you can to respect the principles of increasing the training load progressively, followed by recovery in, in a cycle, ideally three or four week cycles. Now, let's talk, take a look at what should be in part one of your training plan. So the preparation phase, which runs from now until the end of March. The key objectives or focus during this period are, one, to build the capacity to train for 10 or 15 hours or more per week and to ride long distances without undue fatigue. Two, and really as part of the first objective and in parallel with it, to build fat burning capacity and these two represent 90% of your training. The 10% remaining is to build strength and strength endurance. And this will also positively impact your pain tolerance. Finally, include some exercises to work on technical skills such as descending and cornering at speed. So those are the objectives and the focus. Now how to do it. Yeah. Could you put it yeah. There are no shortcuts. Progress to five and then six hour rides at low intensity. Don't succumb to the temptation to push harder. Remember, these rides are supposed to feel slow and 90% of your training should be spent on this. So it's a lot of time riding. These long, slow rides will also help you burn more fat, but only if you adapt your diet. The more carbohydrate and especially sugar you consume, the more your body will prefer to burn glucose, which is exactly what you don't want. Remember, you want it to burn fat. So I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment. But basically, the idea is, 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 is to, con is to con avoid sugar, as much, uh, sugar and, and anything carbohydrate as much as you can. Now let's take a look at the 10% of your training that should, should be focused on high intensity. When it comes to the day, you shouldn't ride at all at high intensity. In fact, on the Tour du Mont Blanc, you're not going to ride at high intensity. So what is so why am I saying this? You know, what is the point of doing some training at high intensity? Let's look at the power duration curve to understand. These high intensity training sessions are really about two things. One, it's, it's basically about pushing that whole curve higher. Because even if you work at high intensity at low durations, it will still improve and affect the lower intensity, higher duration area around your FTP. And the other advantage of doing these type of intervals is that they will increase your pain tolerance. So let's take a look at some examples. First one is a sprint session where you can do uh, from five to 10 seven second sprints during an otherwise easy ride. On the recording here, you can see three sprints with my power in yellow and my heart rate in red. You want to leave enough time between each sprint for your heart rate to come back down, but you don't need to need a lot more than that. I left a good 10 minutes each time, but I didn't need to. Uh, do this for a complete two or three week mesocycle and then recover. So once a week for two or three weeks. And then the next cycle, you could do 15 second sprints and then the one after that, 30 second sprints. Try to keep the power as constant as possible from start to finish. 
And your power will, of course, be lower during a 30 second sprint than during a seven second one. Later, you could either use uh, Tabata type intervals with very short recovery, such as three blocks of 12 times 20 seconds on 10 seconds off or 40 seconds on 20 seconds off with five to 10 minutes between the blocks or move to longer intervals, first one minute and then two minute or three minute uh, with equal recovery time between. Remember that these are as much about pain tolerance as anything else, so they're supposed to hurt. Uh, but the idea is not to go to failure. Uh, you should be able to do the last one completely and correctly and then, and then stop. Leave one in the tank. It can be beneficial to do them at low cadence because it helps both your pedal stroke and to a certain extent your leg strength. So you might want to consider that. Finally, as we said, you should build some exercises for technical skills. Uh, so take every opportunity on your long rides to really practice this. If you're not a confident descender, you might want to consider joining a training camp in the mountains with a coach, a coach who's qualified to teach you to do this. Now, let's get to nutrition and talk about how to use your nutrition strategically to achieve three objectives. One, to fuel your training load so that you're eating exactly what you need, but no more. Two, to achieve your desired weight, which may or may not mean losing a few kilos or more rarely adding some muscle. And three, of course, to optimize your ability to burn fat. Remember, this last objective is essential in order to fuel the long climbs on the Tour du Mont Blanc. Achieving these three objectives together means that you need to adjust your total calories consumed to be equivalent or slightly below the calories you're burning, while adjusting the relative amount of carbohydrate and fats that you eat to correspond to your training load. The basic idea is to train your body to use fat for its base load and low intensity training and only use carbs when you need them at higher intensities. So let's how to see how to do that in practice. So the first point is you vary how much you eat by day, depending on your daily energy expenditure, which, of course, depends on how much you're training on that day. Put simply, on a rest or recovery day, you should eat a lot less than on a hard training day. On the day in the picture, we rode 120k around Mont Ventoux, so it was a pretty hard day and we enjoyed lots of carbs, and that was normal. So you need to calculate your daily energy expenditure. Varying how much you eat according to your training load will help you achieve and maintain your target weight, but this alone isn't going to have any impact on your ability to burn fat. For that, you need to encourage your body to burn fat preferentially to carbohydrate, which means keeping your carb intake low except on the days when you really need it. So ideally, you should be consuming next to no carbs on days when you're not training at all and very little on a recovery day. You only actually need them on a loading day or on a long ride or, or intervals. So you should calculate your energy expenditure on three typical days, low, medium, and high. And then you can create three standard menus that you can use as a baseline. I'm not suggesting you eat the same food every day, but it's a standard menu you can, you can vary from. So let's look at how to do that. Here's an example of, for a fairly typical cyclist of three nutrition plans showing the calorie requirements and the macronutrient breakdown for three different training loads, recovery, loading, and long ride. So there are several things to note. Firstly, the total calorie requirements varies very considerably from 2,600 on a recovery day to 5,100 on a day with a five hour ride. Okay, and obviously it would be more on a day with a seven or eight hour ride. The macronutrient split also varies considerably from 17% carbs, 65% fat and 19% protein all the way to 43% carbs, 45% fats and 13% protein. So note that both fat and protein consumption increase in absolute terms. Uh, that's uh, in the middle there in, in terms of grams. Um, but uh, the variation in percentage is far greater for the, um, for the carbohydrates. The next thing to note is that protein intake is even high, is, is, is quite high even on a recovery day. 125 grams on a recovery. So that uh, corresponds to about 1.8 grams per kilogram. 
uh, which is which is pretty high. But that's important when we're training so 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 hard for such an event. So you should adapt these data for yourself, obviously. I don't have the time this evening to go into the detail, other than to say you need to start by calculating your basal metabolic rate, which for most people is going to be between something like 1,700 and 2,000, 2,100 or 200. It's, that's the energy you just expend to just to stay alive and, and, and sort of move around the house. And then you add the extra expenditure created by your physical activity and training throughout the day. I strongly recommend you read, if you want to learn more, to read Alan Kuzen's book, uh, The Science of Maximal Athletic Development, which is, he's, is on Substack, uh, where he goes into this in detail in chapter 15. And he also provides an online calculator to get your own numbers. So now let's take a look at how to turn these macronutritional targets into actual menus. The best way to create actual menus is to use one of the many online applications. The one I'm using here is called myfitnesspal.com, which is free. It's a very good one. And they have a huge library of different foods, so it's easy to key in your typical menu, as I've done here for my breakfast. You can do the same for, three, for the three main meals, as well as any snacks you eat throughout the day or on the bike. The app then adds it all up for you, calculates for you, the total calories for each meal and for the day, as well as the breakdown between carbs, fat, and protein. Of course, that's what we're looking for. It's then easy to delete or add new menu item, items or to change the quantities of a menu item until you reach your target values for the day. And then you've got your menu for the day. This leaves the final question. Okay, great, but what foods are best? In terms of carbs, you should prefer the most natural, high quality and complex varieties such as fruit and vegetables, lentils, beans, pulses, nuts, and so on and so forth. Avoid sugar in all its refined forms. And remember, lots of it is hidden in cakes, biscuits, and industrial foods. So, so stay away from all of that. The only exception to this is on a big day on the bike, where the sheer quantity of carbs you need to consume means that you're more or less forced to use sports nutrition and especially energy drinks. Uh, you shouldn't need to use sports nutrition during a one hour interval session or indeed any ride less than less than two or three hours. In terms of fat, once again, we're looking for the highest quality natural forms, more vegetable than animal. Good sources are as follows avocados, hard cheeses, olives and olive oil, nuts and seeds, and also things like coconuts, coconut oil, oily fish, salmon, sardines, mackerel, trout, tuna, whole fat yogurt, eggs, and I'm glad to say dark chocolate in moderation, obviously. And then last but not least is the protein. So here too, it's important to choose uh, based on the quality, lean meat, poultry, we see fish again, uh, cheese again, uh, Greek yogurt again, they're all good sources, both of protein and fat as well as vegetable proteins that you find in lentils, beans, cereals, nuts, tofu, chickpeas, oats, wild ice, wild rice, and so on and so forth. So the message here is as much variety as possible and the highest quality possible. Now, this is the final subject, preparation off the bike. It's an unpopular subject for many people. Sadly, the best way to strengthen your muscles is off the bike. It's important because there's no way to strengthen your muscles really significantly on the bike. And the only way to climb faster and to ride faster and is to be able to push harder on the pedals. And that means stronger legs. So you need to work off the bike for that. To strengthen your legs and core, you should do one or two sessions per week, ideally guided by a strength and conditioning coach with experience in cycling. Uh, there's quite a lot available online um, if you don't have a gym close by. So, so it's, it's not hard to find these days. The goal at this time of year is to increase the strength of your leg and core muscles. Now, if you're new to it, do please err on the side of caution to limit the risk of injury. The most basic exercises are things like squats, lunges, planks, bridges, bicycle kicks, roll downs, and so on. You don't, need, uh, you don't need to be in a gym for that. You don't need any weights or any material. 
but there are many more which are beneficial. The key is to learn the proper technique, again, to avoid injury. Next, and equally important, is mobility and flexibility. Here you should be doing two to three 15 or 20 minute sessions per week. Pilates or yoga are, are great for this, one or the other. Again, learning correct te technique is vital. So choose a practitioner who knows cycling and only takes small groups or better still individuals and, and make sure you've got the good technique. Finally, strongly recommend you should complement your cycling with some additional um, easy, easy sports such as walking, running or swimming, because if cycling is your only sport, you risk building up imbalances and soft tissue problems over time, and you will definitely live to regret it. So, so don't be a pure cyclist only. It, it's not good. I'm speaking from experience. That's it. I've given you the principles and guidelines that should allow you to prepare yourself well between now and the end of March. So rendezvous, if you like, on the on March the 28th to talk about part two, the pre-competition period. In the meantime, it's up to you. Take the principles, create your own training plan, and then and then follow it. Uh, be consistent. If you'd like professional help to be at your absolute best on uh, when when we get to the event, we can help you, of course, in two different ways. You can join one of our coaching camps for a big block of training as well as one-on-one -on -one coaching on your tech technical skills and of course plenty of advice and tips for the for your preparation and for the event itself you can contact us for one-on-one -on -one coaching and finally i'm always happy to answer questions feel free to send them to me at info at alpinecalls.com thank you very much for listening